Afi, feel free to come and sit and fill in the, the rows here too, please. Thanks. <laughs> so Mary, how long are you trying to keep this to? You're going to go the full hour? Bailed on my person. I feel like it all got said just now. I feel like saying Google. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started with our second panel. I think during this panel we want to talk a little bit about, among other things, the public diplomacy elements of the kinds of issues we've been talking about earlier. In other words, people influencing each other and the role of all the different players in solving issues that, that cannot be solved only by government decisions and government expenditure of funds. So I think we'll be talking about all of those uh, things right now. I'd like very briefly to introduce the three panelists. Uh, you have their full bios in the handout, Thank you so much. but I just wanted to uh, give a few key highlights. Um, and so Mary Ellsberg is the director of George Washington University's Global Women's Institute a job to which she brings more than 30 years of experience in international research and program work. Before joining the university last year, she was vice president for research and programs at the International Center for Research on Women. Previously, she served as senior advisor for gender, violence, and human rights for the uh, nonprofit organization PATH. Dr. Ellsberg also lived for many years in Nicaragua, leading public health and women's rights advocacy. In March of this year, she was one of six representatives chosen by the Department of State to attend the 57th session of the UN Commission on the Status of Women as a public delegate. The theme of this year's session is, the, is or has just been last month, the elimination and prevention of all forms of violence against women and girls. So thank you, Mary, for joining us. Um, Maureen Cormack, on the far end of the panel, is the Principal Deputy Coordinator for the State Department's Bureau of International Information Programs. She's a career Foreign Service Officer whose previous assignments in Washington, D.C. have included Executive Assistant in the Office of the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Director of the Office of Western European Affairs, Deputy Director of Korean Affairs, and as a Pearson Fellow on the Homeland Security Committee of the House of Representatives. Overseas, Ms. Cormack has worked on both press and cultural affairs at U.S. embassies in South Korea, Paris, and Warsaw, and served as first consul at the innovative American President's Post in Western France. Before she joined the Foreign Service, Ms. Cormack worked in fundraising, public relations, and artistic management for the summer home of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Ravinia Festival, as well as for a prominent Chicago law firm. In the middle, we have Lisa Veneklasen, who is the executive director and co-founder of Jazz Cross Regional. Also, is it still known as or was known as Just Associates? Just Associates. Okay. For over 30 years, she has been an activist, educator, strategist, and organization builder for numerous social justice and women's rights efforts worldwide, working with and advising many international development and human rights organizations. Trained as a community organizer, Ms. Veneklasen was drawn to Nicaragua in the 1980s, where she worked for two years with the Sandinista government's adult literacy program. Refocusing her attention on U.S. policy, she co-led fact-finding missions of opinion leaders to Central America, served as a legislative aide for a U.S. representative, and organized for peace. She went on to work with women's rights and development organizations in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Eastern Europe at one point relocating to Zimbabwe for a training and networking project that led to the creation of the Pan-African Women in Law and Development in Africa. Ms. Veneklazen also serves on boards and advisory groups for several global, global initiatives and partnerships, including one formed by women who have won the Nobel Prize. 
So before, I would like to ask each of our panelists just, just to speak very briefly on kind of their own perspective on the topic of the day. But first I wanted to mention that as we were chatting earlier, it turned, it, it, I discovered that both Mary and Lisa were in Beijing in 1995 for the Women's Conference. And I'd like to ask them just to talk for a minute or two about that experience. Um, yes, we were on very much the other side. I think Lisa and I, we didn't know each other then, but I think we were both in the rain <laughs> outside yeah. in for, and kind of to show in some ways how far we've come and how far we still have to go. In those days during the, um, the UN Conference on Women, the, it was being held in Beijing and they took all the NGOs and the women's activists who had been working so hard to really get this declaration um, out and move them 40 miles outside of town to Wairo, so that in this really muddy, rainy place, so that no, so that we would not be sort of contaminating the political discussion <laughs> going on. And there was this very thrilling moment. But at the same time, thinking about that, it was really a great period because the women's movement was really on a roll, and we had just had in 1993 the Vienna Conference on Human Rights, and that's really where the women's movement really pushed the slogan, women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. That initially came out of that conference um, and was something that the, the women's movement was really pushing. After that, Cairo, um, the International Conference on Population and Development, another huge um, turning point in terms of recognizing, um, reframing the debate on population around, again, now reproductive rights and women's choices. So here we are at Beijing the next year and to have the U.S. delegation coming to Wairo and to have the First Lady taking on the slogans of the women's movements and repeating women's rights or human rights was this really thrilling moment, even though we got completely soaked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a logistical nightmare and muddy and a mess. But I, I and also in that space was a moment when there was a big shift happening uh, among women's rights worldwide, which was the sort of global south feminists emerging and really challenging the dominance of the feminists in the global north and the agendas of the global north. And it was a really interesting tug of war and reconciliation. And so both Mary and I, coming as critics of the US, as activists trying to change US foreign policy, pushing from the outside and very much situating ourselves with feminist movements in the global south and women's rights groups, it was kind of, a, I remember feeling very nervous because you know, we, we didn't expect a government official from the US to come out so clearly on the side and connect herself directly with global women's movements. And it, you could feel a change happening because the first thing she did when she arrived, I mean, is is to say this is disgusting that we're stuck out here. I don't remember what exactly what it was. Do you remember how she just brought herself, connected every, herself with, with everyone and spoke the language that was, that was being talked, the, the language that was being used in the, the space itself. And it was a, a moment I felt very proud to have uh, her in representing the US. If I can add to that just because this is, I'm sorry, were you? No, go ahead on this. Just, on the, just the Beijing. The 95 part. Yeah. Yes. We were there, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll say the, I want to mention the CSW, but I can do that later then. OK. I'll do that. Yes. Uh, yes, so I did want to, um, you know, thinking in particular about, uh, Mary, your kind of experience looking at um, things sort of from the 30,000 feet up view, at least at times, um, global policy, not just US policy. And uh, Maureen, your work at the State Department working on the relationship between people, influential people and other people around the world, um, as a representative of the U.S. government. And then Lisa, your work working with women in other countries, uh, women leaders at the grassroots level and higher levels. So we thought we would go in that order, Mary and Maureen and Lisa, and e ask you each to just speak a few minutes. That brings me to my next point, <laughs> which is, I mean, I think just a little bit of context. So that's 95, almost 20 years ago. And as I say, we were really on a roll 
we had just changed, and there was the social development um, summit in Copenhagen. We had just changed the way people were talking about women's rights and about development and about human rights. It was the first time that domestic violence was recognized as a human rights violation. The idea being that human rights violations are not just what states do against individual citizens, but what citizens can do each other, to each other in the private sphere, if that's tolerated by the state, is also a human rights violation. So this total, um, really just like new paradigms, and then there is this long drought <laughs> of, of 20 years where you know, you would hope at this point that we would have solved many of, the, of these problems and we wouldn't have to be still discussing whether women have a right to contraception or to choice or whether rape is forcible, whether you can have a forcible or a non-forcible rape. I mean, all of these things that are still on the table, which is, you know, which is the sad news. Um, but what came around for me was in the CSW meeting, and I just before she leaves, I wanted to acknowledge Acting Ambassador Sharon Weiner from the State Department, who is um, the Acting Ambassador f uh, at Large for Women Global Women's Issues right now. While we're waiting for the for the um, the uh, confirmation, thank you. I was about to say ratification, but that's not <laughs> of, of Kathy Russell. And under her leadership and Ambassador Rice, what a thrilling moment it was again after this kind of long drought and the U.S. not really taking a, a strong position. And now I'm sort of on the other side of it suddenly and kind of um, surprisingly on the U.S. government delegation, <laughs> which I've never done before. Um, and I was, it wasn't, when, when Ambassador Steinberg talks about people, he kind of, I totally agree with the people, policies, and programs, but it's more than just a few people or individuals, and that's something that I would just like to point out here, that the White House also has had huge um, support for women's issues through Valerie Jarrett and Tina Chen for the very first time. We have a Violence Against Women advisor, Lynn Rosenthal, in the White House. This is all, you know, very new. And the position of the, of the um, delegation, it was so many people. It was not just um, in, Acting Ambassador Weiner and, and Rice, but people from HHS, from State, from USAID. There were like 40 people during that whole period of the Commission of the Status of Women meeting. And the reason it was important was that the last meeting of CSW, there were no agreed conclusions, and the last time 10 years ago that violence against women was discussed at the CSW, governments were not able to agree on what to do. And this time there was a lot of opposition from a lot of different countries about, um, about such basic issues as, you know, whether girls should be included in the term violence against women, whether intimate partner violence was a term we wanted to promote because that kind of implies that women might be having sex or intimate relations outside of marriage, and obviously that can't happen, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this whole delegation was so committed, and the first thing I heard when they came in was, well, we're going to make sure that we, our goal is to push beyond Cairo and Beijing. We are completely supporting LGBT rights. We're completely supporting reproductive rights, and that's our bottom line, and we're not going to go anywhere back from Beijing and Cairo. And, that was, again, very thrilling to see our government taking such a leadership role and such a principled position on these issues where there really hasn't internationally been nearly enough um, you know, progress in the last 20 years since Beijing. Um, let's see, I, maybe one more minute. Um, moving backwards around this, so I feel is I wanted to say that these different policies, both the National Action Plan, the Gender-Based Violence Strategy, the gender policy in USAID, these are also really important. And some of them came about, and we had a lot of conversations with Ambassador Revere and with Ambassador Steinberg at the beginning of the administration because we've been pushing for a very long time for the International Violence Against Women Act through Congress. That would make a lot more funding available. It would have created the position of the, of the ambassador on global women's affairs, but also a lot more funding on these issues. And we have not been able to get it passed in Congress. And so the very first discussion was, well, wait a second. We're in the government now. We don't actually have to have the appropriations and the mandate from Congress. You can start implementing IVAWA without having the law. And that's really what they did. And we are very appreciative of that. Um, 
On the other hand, and this brings me to the point I wanted to make about challenges moving forward, is that um, when this, you know, we've got four more years. And yes, there's, some of the challenges are institutionalizing the different policies that have come into place, um, you know, getting it into everybody's DNA, getting a lot more investment and funding, more evidence, and I really appreciate that that's been a key pillar of the GBV strategy and that Ambassador Revere has talked about it so much. However, um, if we don't get IVAWA passed during this period, if we don't ratify CEDAW, like, we're never going to ratify CEDAW. That's so important, the, commission, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Everywhere, and I'm sure uh, Ambassador Weiner has already found this now, everywhere you go representing the U.S. government on women's issues, people say, well, what about CEDAW? You know, how can you have any kind of legitimacy if you don't, if, if the U.S. is one of the few countries together with Somalia, South Sudan, and three or four other countries that have not ratified CEDAW? Um, so I'm thinking more about post this, post period, post this administration, how do we guarantee that um, some of these gains are kept in place? And again, around the Millennium Development Goals, we didn't do nearly enough on this round to get gender-based violence and gender integrated into the Millennium Development Goals in a really substantive way. Um, and now for the post-development, um, 2015 Sustainable Development Goals again. So we really have to be much more active in the international arena, I think, to keep this going. Over to you. Okay. Well, I'm going to approach that from a slightly different tack, as Mary Jeffers knows, because what we do in public diplomacy is not the policy. It's not the government-to-government -government part that you've talked about, that Malian talked about nor is it the development piece that Don Steinberg addressed so eloquently. It is the people to people. And on the people side, of course, America has done a ton. And so the United States has many voices that can be very effective overseas. And our role is to connect those with women and increasingly to try to connect them with men overseas to make the advocacy case for women's issues abroad. Um, so for one minute, let me just talk a little bit about how public diplomacy works in the State Department. Um, we are all under and under secretary for public diplomacy and public affairs. There are three pieces of this, three bureaus. I think most people know what public affairs does, all of the press work, all of the outreach domestically here in the United States to tell Americans what the State Department does and why foreign policy matters. The other two bureaus are really focused more overseas. Um, the bureau I represent, uh, information, international information programs, uh, it has a mandate to work uniquely overseas by law. Uh, we are the people that bring the places, the products, and the infrastructure to have the really sustained conversations about these major issues with foreign audiences. Uh, we run 850 American spaces, ranging from little corners in a foreign university or a library to major American centers. Uh, we also have a very large social media presence, about 11 million of our own fans in six languages on multiple platforms. We support all of our 450 posts around the world on their social media outreach. Uh, we produce a lot of products, including things like our very beautiful women's book with the foreword by Hillary Clinton and the introduction by Milan Verveer, which I'll pass to our ladies up here. Um, we do a lot of videos. We had a very compelling video this past year by, Secret uh, by Ambassador Rice, Susan Rice at the United Nations for Libya, urging Libyan women to both vote and to run for office that increased female voting within a very short period of time by over 30%, a really clear impact uh, because she is so well thought of in that society. Um, and then we also do a whole range of publications. We do these little e-journal magazines. This one is on enterprising women and thriving societies. Um, and then we also run all of our embassy websites and other infrastructure. The third bureau in public diplomacy is educational and cultural affairs. And Mary had first invited, in fact, my colleague from that bureau to speak here because they have done extraordinary work as well in the area of women's issues. They um, run a number of exchange programs. They are the ones who actually bring the International Women of Courage each year to the State Department. Uh, as you know, Secretary Kerry ran that event this year, speaking very eloquently about the importance of women's affairs for foreign policy, for peace, 
security, and economic development around the world. Um, the, uh, our colleagues in ECA also run great programs such as Tech Women that brings women from the Middle East and North Africa to the United States to meet with their counterparts and really go back to be entrepreneurs to really generate economic development in their countries. That was so successful they have now created a Tech Girls program that brings younger girls over for a summer program with their American peers on campuses to learn how to become generators of entrepreneurship. Uh, in the opposite direction, IIP takes U.S. expert speakers overseas. Uh, and we have people who go out and talk in person. We can also do this virtually on everything from women entrepreneurs to how women can be a force against violence in their countries, for how women can take up a political role in their governments. And we have people like former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who will do a program this month uh, virtually with Afghanistan on the role of women in rule of law. So before I close, I have a lot more I could say, but I want to leave time for others. You know, just in the next couple of months, we are going to be sending American women to speak about women's issues in the following countries, Tajikistan, Mexico, France, Nepal, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Jordan, India, Sri Lanka, and the Maldives. And so this is really a global network really connecting the excellence of American women on these issues with their counterparts abroad and really building those bridges so that we can help drive forward around the world the great progress that we have made here in the United States, even if we still need more. <laughs> I'll stop there. So this is kind of the view from the bottom up. JAZZ is an international women's rights organization, and we're built on these three regional platforms. Mexico, Central America, Southern Africa, Southeast Asia, working in 27 countries. And so we have these amazing listservs that can generate conversations very quickly between hundreds of women in different languages, grassroots activists, women's rights leaders, et cetera. And so I asked them, when Mary sent me the invitation, I asked them, what was the leg legacy of Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, and one, what difference has she made in terms of women's rights where you live and what you're doing? And so I want to share some of their, uh, I'm going to paraphrase some of the things they said, but I want to share some of the juiciest quotes, right? Okay. So they, they responded, you know, the, the countries, in, the people came from Zimbabwe, Uganda, Malawi, Zambia, South Africa, Cambodia, India, Mexico, Honduras, uh, a huge range, Indonesia, a huge range of countries. And, and uh, one Mexican colleague said, we knew she was there when they, when they immediately reversed the global gag rule. Uh, this was the beginning of what many people said was, is a process still underway of repairing a lot of damage? And I think Mary referred to it. Is, the, the Bush administration did a lot of damage in the eyes of women's rights activists and groups worldwide and had an approach that generally was a rescue-oriented approach that didn't take into account women's rights and, and used saving women as, as a justification for war, which particularly our Middle Eastern sisters are highly critical of. And this conversation that was generated on the listserv was, continues to be very critical of U.S. Po foreign policy, but very uh, strong and positive feelings about Hillary Clinton and her legacy. And they fit under sort of five categories. And one is the power of her leadership story, which is huge. The power of her words and her ability to change the conversation the lasting power of her endorsement and recognition of us, is what many, many women said. Uh, her power to change the arrangements, and that many people referred to as the last lap. She was the tipping point. Women's rights groups have been working on these issues for many, many years, like sexual violence and conflict. But when Hillary Clinton moved into the agenda, it was the tipping point. And lastly, the power to mobilize and redirect resources. And there, the impact on the ground has been felt uh, a bit less. And so let me just give you some highlights from, from some of these, because I think they're, they're fun to hear. Um, 
from South African, from a South African friend, watching her run for president was a big lesson in women and power politics. She knew how to play hardball. But even more important was how she lost the election and how she went on to serve her president as his foreign minister and that she was also the first high, first high level US official to demonstrate seriousness about women's rights. A Kenyan colleague said, we still talk about how she lost because it's a big lesson in democracy provided by a powerful feminist that we still refer to in our countries. In Zimbabwe, a friend mentioned that there's a whole group of young women in schools who are studying her life as a role model uh, and as an example, and including her education strategies. Um, a Muslim feminist from Indonesia mentioned that though it has been very hard to defend US foreign policy in terms of the impact it's had on Muslim communities and this sort of thing from where she sits, Hillary has been a powerful example in terms of how she managed the compromises of her personal life and her marriage. So these are, that's, those have been the biggest impact. The power of her words. Many people refer to her speech on gay rights. It actually gave Ugandan activists, many of whom we work with in my organization, the courage to organize a gay, uh, gay pride parade in such a context. Um, bringing women's rights to the highest level, and I think there's a, a really interesting quote from a, a, a friend from India. In an era of leaning in, investing in girls, and other magic bullets that leave structural inequality intact, her insistence on women's rights really matters and she's at the highest level, including with the private sector. So an example of the lasting power of her words and her endorsement as the tipping point comes from uh, a Liberian friend who has been working on sexual violence and conflict for 25 years. And she says, she was the game changer. In the UN Security Council, we had statements and declarations condemning sexual violence, but we did not have the tools to help member states go after perpetrators. We simply would not have Security Council Resolution 1820 and 1960 without her, and that's what all the local groups are using. Her trip to the Congo made a huge difference, with thousands of women crying for action and the activists struggling to support them but most of all, when an official from the highest levels of government in the most powerful country in the world steps in, governments pay attention. It wasn't just the Congolese government, it was the surrounding government. And the women felt safer by her voice. I think a lot of us have talked about the different policy arrangements and shifts and Many referred to how important it was to them that for the first time the U.S. had a gender equality policy at the highest levels in terms of foreign policy. And that was huge, particularly when the women's rights community worldwide turns to the global north for resources and policy support and have tended to turn to Europe on these issues until now. But I want to talk lastly, and this is the challenge. Um, on the, 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 her power to redirect and mobilize resources. And this is where there were a lot of doubts and questions and further action because this is a group of women across the world who believe that funding women's rights organizations and women's rights movements is what drives change at all levels. And without those movements, Hillary Clinton's influence in political structures would not be able to move forward. And so this is the infrastructure that keeps these issues on the agenda, that continues to empower women, that continues to, continues to train women. So for this group of people, for, for this group of people, funding women's rights groups are critical. And this is where there's a, a shortfall. And I just want to do two quotes for, um, I actually don't think that Hillary's influence has moved much more resources for women's rights, at least yet. 
Vital Bo Voices as one of her favorite U.S.-based projects is, of course, huge and important. But I don't think more resources are reaching women's organizations or movements out in the world, partly because of how these organizations are positioned. They're too small and not working with big U.S. NGOs who tend not to have a women's rights agenda. Um, Hillary had a big influence on private sector funding, particularly in the Clinton Global Initiative. Big pledges to the tune of $45 billion are coming from the private sector, although those don't transla translate into money transfers. This is just a start, and many, many recognize that policy change and resources out the door of the long bureaucratic pipeline takes a lot of time. But many recognize that the, the new U.S. initiatives over the last four years give activists very useful policy tools to continue pressuring government for more resources, more action. Our colleagues in Mexico and Central America feel that they can use the National Action Plan for Women, Peace, and Security to begin to challenge a more, the military-focused uh, policies of the drug war. Uh, women feel that they can use other pieces of policy to push for more resources directly for women's rights. And, and a, lot of, a lot of groups hold the, the bar high uh, using the example of the Dutch government, which over the last uh, six years created three big funds which supported women's rights groups around the world, outside the U.S., and those were the MDG3 fund, which gave 84 million, million euros to about 40 women's rights organizations, followed by the Flow Fund, which gave 70 million euros to about 30 women's rights organizations, and more recently, a $125 million euro, million euro fund on sexual and reproductive rights. And those, that money goes straight to the NGOs outside the U.S., and I think those are the arrangements that still haven't shifted, that big U.S. organizations continue to receive those kinds of money earmarked for women and women's rights issues who may not have a women's rights agenda. Thank you very much for those very diverse, but I thought really interesting sets of comments. <laughs> um, and thank you, Lisa, for bringing those voices in. Thank you so much. I, you know, I happened to hear on Kojo Nandi yesterday a really interesting discussion about development assistance. Who knew that Kojo Nandi talked about these kinds of things all the time? It's great. And it was really interesting because one, one of the speakers, one of the guests, was emphasizing that increasingly civil society organizations, and particularly women's organizations, because she represented one, um, felt like they had the power these days, whether it's through just uh, more practice or more transparent communication opportunities, to, to hold their own governments accountable. And she was strongly urging that the development assistance go through governments, local host, you know, foreign governments. Um, the first caller was a founder, one of the founders of Transparency International, who was kind of like, oh, no, <laughs> that's not a good idea. Um, and and, and I, they, everybody seemed to agree that the grassroots civil society organizations needed the resources. But since there was so much disagreement on how to get it to them, from the foreign donors, it, I just am wondering, first of all, how it, if, if this seems like a reasonable, I mean, in other words, is this an important discussion or did I just happen to hear a stray unimportant discussion? But bringing in the role of reaching out to individuals and building bridges with influential individuals in our new sort of more transparent, more networked communications environment in the 21st century, is there the opportunity to kind of leverage development and public diplomacy to move civil society players sort of further up to where they can really take more control of moving these resources? I know it's a little bit of a complicated question, but any thoughts on that? I mean, I think what was exciting about the Dutch funding opportunity is that it gave many of us involved in women's rights the opportunity to look at and answer this question. How do you get more money to civil society organizations operating at the mid-level and also supporting grassroots organizations. And so 
They adopted that strategy, which involved funding women's funds, a whole series of international women's funds that were able to get money out to especially grassroots groups in small amounts, $5,000, $10,000, that small, the majority of women's organizations are very small and manage a small amount of money. But to direct a significant amount of money to scale up the mid-level international women's rights organizations and regional women's rights organizations, like Women's Law in Southern Africa, Women in Law in Southern Af uh, in, in Africa, WILDAF, Women's Law and Development, like uh, CLADEM, the committee, Latin American Committee Encuentro. for Women's Rights, Puntos de Encuentro, a big sort of social media organization, like my organization, which is very much mid-level, like the Association for Women's Rights and Development, which is now doing the, the research on where's the money for women's rights. And that, that was a game changer for, for all of us. And there's, uh, together we've done a lot of research on the cumulative impact of funding such a mixed collection of uh, women's rights groups. And the research is called Women Moving Mountains. And it could be, it can be found on the AWID's website. Do you know AWID, Association for Women's Rights and Development? It's an international membership organization. It originally was a U.S. organization. It's now international based in, in Mexico and South Africa, et cetera. So, and it, and it really, it works very effectively. Uh, and I think the fear that um, development assistance would be channeled through governments who are often, which are often uh, threatened by or, um, you know, not supportive of women's rights in the least is a non-starter for many women's groups. One of the things this, one of the things the State Department has tried to do a lot in recent years is in fact to partner with the private sector and, you know, although we're in the public diplomacy world, not in the position of funding organizations, other parts can be. Um, we certainly have worked with a lot of other groups to try to do the capacity building on the ground. So as people get the funding, we can provide the assistance on how to move forward and how to really give them the tools and the knowledge and the access to information. You know, a, a recent group visited one of our Amer small American learning spaces in Afghanistan. You know, the women there had never used the internet and never heard of Facebook. And so you're in many places dealing with a very different information society. And the funds alone are a starting point, but really connecting them into that global network of women's expertise is vital. I would be really surprised that a women's rights activist said that funding should go through the states. Um, <laughs> I, should, I should yeah. clarify, she was in the health field, yeah. but there's a women's so, so there's different issues there. One is that states should, right now civil society is doing a lot of um, the functions in many countries that states should be doing. So, you know, basic health care, for example, or education, or places where the state is not, you know, is not fulfilling its obligations. So clearly, foreign assistance should be helping to strengthen the capacity of governments to provide those kinds of basic services. Um, on the other hand, in terms of, as Lisa said, in terms of women's rights, um, violence against women, we want the state to have laws and we want them to implement the laws and we want the police to do their job in terms of helping women access justice. But on the other hand, I also really strongly believe that we need to have more funding going to civil society and to the women's rights groups who have been doing this forever and who are the ones who know how to do it and who are going to be demanding the accountability there. Um, it's a really, in general, a really bad time for funding of women's rights organizations. And a lot of organizations, um, the Sarchi Bartman uh, Refugee uh, Shelter in South Africa, for example, one of the very early ones is closing down. A lot of shelters are closing down right now because of lack of funding. So that I, I agree that the Dutch initiative is a great model. Um, Ivawa includes money working directly for, going directly to women's groups, and that was very deliberately put in there because, um, because you need civil society for all of this to work. And I think another piece that's really important about U.S. policy is the convening power. So it's not, and that's again Hillary's legacy, it's not yeah. just the money, it's um, the fact that the U.S. government has the capacity 
to make sure that women's voices are represented at the table in, in bilateral, make, turning bilateral discussions into multilateral and, and, um, and that's hugely important and that doesn't cost anything and, and I do hope that we continue to maintain that policy. Thank you. My question about, uh, is about uh, CEDAW. Could you please um, comment why the U.S. doesn't ratify uh, uh, CEDAW? Uh, it's, I'm, I believe that the U.S. Uh, um, <laughs> does not uh, against gender equality. It's different from countries like uh, Iran, Sudan, and Somalia uh, that against uh, gender equality, against the, in the content of the... Uh, convention. Thank you. Well, one important point is that it's not, and this is the statement that everybody from the State Department always says, is that President Obama is in favor of ratifying CEDAW. It's the Senate who ratifies by a supermajority. Is that correct? So it's got to be over 60 people. So you need, you need a larger majority than, um, than we currently have to ratify it. Um, now, does, you know, does everybody in the United States believe in gender equality? I think that you would, um, you know, there's some question there, but also a lot of it has to do with the U.S. doesn't, it does not ratify a lot of international agreements because um, they interpret it as having, infringing on states' autonomy and, you know, this, the, the, there's one organization that's really strongly against ratifying CEDAW and says basically kind of, you know, all women will have to have abortions if we ratify CEDAW, and all girls will, you know, it'll somehow make all these international laws that will supersede U.S. laws, which is not true, but that's what, that's kind of my understanding of what's going on. The other piece of it, of course, is when a, when a country ratifies an international convention, they then are obliged to ensure that all of their domestic laws are in line with the basic premises in the convention. And that would be, it involves some policy change, and serious policy change in the U.S., which again supersedes the state's rights. Remember, the states are very powerful. So we would have to get maternity leave. We would have to seriously enshrine equal pay for equal work. We would have to take a number of measures uh, that, because we take laws seriously, because we are uh, a country that's very serious about this, we probably might even have to put in an equality clause for women in the Constitution. So these are, these are huge issues. And, I don't know if some of you have been watching the, the PBS series, um, is it The Movers? It's oh, the about makers. women's rights. The Makers. The makers. Right. It's, it's right. about women's rights. It's really great stories, and, and one of them is about the failure of the Equal Rights Amendment, which was an effort. Sad story. It's, a, it's quite an exciting, interesting, it's a very powerful story, and that would have enabled the U.S., of course, to be very far ahead in terms of its equality. But it's a good story to, to really understand the politics and the resistance to gender equality in different ways in the U.S. And, and I think many of us who have been women's rights activists for many years feel as though we are really treading water and holding the line today, not just in the U.S., but uh, in different parts of the world. There some exciting high-level events. It's positive to have prominent women and important women, particularly like Hillary Clinton, moving this agenda forward and being a women's rights advocate in public. But on the ground, there, the backlash is so well-financed and so effective and working to reverse a lot of the gains. So it's not a given that you keep moving forward. It is, is quite a, a serious and ongoing struggle for um, for women's rights, and I think in the U.S., we're 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 in a little bit of a tug of war on that that issue as well. <laughs>
Um, Maureen, uh, I wonder if you could talk about, um, sort of expand on some of the things that Milan Revere was talking about, about the empiricism and the weight of that in making some of these arguments. From a public diplomacy standpoint, this is uh, an age-old problem of how to quantify the gains made or not made so that you can make sensible decisions and justify them to Congress and other pro and appropriators. Um, what have you guys seen that works? How do you know that it works, and in, in specifically in relation to women and girls? And um, what types of programming that you're involved in or that you've seen elsewhere at state in the public diplomacy arena um, is you know, particularly successful? Right, I, Sean, you're right, obviously, that you know, gathering that evidence on public diplomacy is challenging because it's a long-term investment. Um, ECA has done a very good job of really tracking the participants in their programs and where they go after, you know, whether it's one year or five years down the road. Um, and what they see is that you know, men and women alike, many of the people who they invest in, who they bring here, who they establish through these programs, go on to become leaders in their societies. And so that's one of the key indicators, you know, is the percentage, which is significant, of people who, after coming here, either become a member of the government, who become a senior member of the media, who rise to a level of a professor in an academic setting. Uh, and so they, I don't have the numbers with me, but have very good reporting on that. Uh, they have quite a number of the participants who really rise to leadership roles in their government, up to and including prime minister and president. Um, for our speaker programs, it's a little bit more subjective. Uh, you know, a lot of it has to end up being numbers of reach as opposed to impact because it's hard to capture that in all cases. Um, in terms of women's programs, the numbers that I do have, though, I think are interesting. Uh, from the public diplomacy reporting tool that we have, over the last 12 months, our posts around the world have done 3,000 programs on women's events. Uh, which make up about 10% of all of our public diplomacy activities this past year. Uh, the reach of those, whether through social media, traditional media, or direct interaction, is over 40 million people. And just in the month of March, Women's History Month, which is one of our major focuses each year, our posts hosted 650 activities. So you don't get the results of those the next day, as you well know. It's over the course of time. Certainly on our rule of law programs, we have begun to see as countries in the Middle East and elsewhere write new constitutions. Again, we're seeing women's rights being written into some of those documents. The implementation factor that others have spoken about is critical, and that's where that NGO sector, that private sector comes in, making sure that once these are written in, governments are actually implementing what they've committed to. Um, but our role is getting it there in the first place, and we are starting to see that happen more and more. Um, so, you know, I don't have a lot of the numbers with me, but um, we can pull some of those and others we keep trying to collect as the long-term effects are seen. I just want to make a quick, I know that in uh, the Center for Excellence, the, uh, in the DRL, in the State <laughs> Department, are doing a, a somewhat serious uh, study on the impact of different uh, endeavors to support women's political pr pr participation over the last 15 years. And so I, I, I think that will be produce really interesting results and is worth following up on. I think both Mary and I would fully agree from the civil society side there is uh, a need to increase investment in gathering evidence and developing more innovative ways of gathering evidence. We can measure if a law is passed, and we can measure how many women are in the legislature. What is much more difficult to measure is obviously the behavior change and what happens in families and communities over time and with young men and with young girls and people's basic you know, behavior. That is much more difficult to, to measure over time, and there aren't a lot of resources to measure that or to develop the tools to measure that effectively. And it tends to be over, you know, 15, 20 year time period. What we, one of the things we're doing in jazz is 
starting to measure and uh, develop uh, sort of a way of capturing conflict. Because when you are successful in women's rights, it generates conflict. It generates conflict in families, in relationships, in communities. Not everybody's excited that a woman is going to speak out and she's going to make change. In fact, very few people are excited and it can be very isolating in the early period of the, of the organizing work. And so capturing that conflict and being able to organize and, and uh, design our work around mitigating and shaping that conflict is a new way of thinking about how change happens in women's rights. That's interesting. Just if I can add something on that. One of the things that a lot of our American spaces in the more difficult parts of the world have started to do is either to segregate one room or certain days of the week for women. Because there are a lot of societies where women will not come into our spaces if men are there. And so by creating that community space for women, I think they're trying to give them a safe space to have those more difficult conversations. Another issue just that I would say around the evidence piece is that um, USAID and all donors are very focused on results right now, and rightly so. We want to make sure that what we're doing makes a difference in women's lives. We care as much about that as anybody else. But um, the problem is the funding cycles tend to be, not only is there very little money set aside for research, but the funding cycles are two to five years at the most, and social change takes a really long time. And so we're having this problem of the ultimate, um, the ultimate sort of sign of success would be that you have less women being beaten or that you know, men are less violent. And you're very, very unlikely to achieve that or be able to show that in a three to five year period. So that's something I think we're really wrestling with um, in terms of you know, evidence of effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.